stepped away somewhere, from Michael. There he is, he's just floating in his six minute slide there. Um, uh, and then as I, as I say, if you need to duck out or whatever, you feel free to get up and move away. But after this one, we're going to have a 10 minute break, we're going to go to the toilet, go and get a burger, roll, whatever, and then we'll go up. But now, Michael. The council had 
no money, and so they were trying to obtain money either from the tolls or from the, the few owners of the land in, in McDonald Town to pay for the toll. But the area itself was a quagmire, dangerous to life, limb, and health. It doesn't get any better from there. Mm -hmm. So moving on, he traces across the north part of, it, of present day Ursinville, coming up through uh, the railway line, not quite under construction, and passing through um, culverts, directly across streets, and it smells a bit. <laughs> it's, it's rather unpleasant. Um, and they question whether anyone was responsible for the sanitation of the area. I had several special things to say about Union Street, um, in that it, uh, it possessed street rainbows. Um, there was an accumulation of butcher's wastes, um, I think it was cream in colour, uh, coming down, probably in that area now where the, the Newtown Central is, um, with butcher's waste coming down through that, that valley uh, beneath the tram shed and it comes down to the bottom of, of Money Street and um, <coughs> Union Street. There. So um, he didn't think much of it at all. It's the Alan Jones of his time, I think. <laughs> <laughs> he, he had very little positive things to say. He, he introduced that, you know, he would. He would shine a positive light um, upon any suburb he encountered and then carried on um, to, to pan it absolutely. He actually dedicated a, a poem to McDonald Town. Um, I'd need a Scotsman to, to quote it because it's a, it's a, wonderful, um, a wonderful poem, uh, again, panning McDonald Town. So, he had one final thing to say before he took on Newtown, uh, which is that the streets, both as the narrowness, works of construction therein, and architecture are such that should not be tolerated in a civilised community. <laughs> uh, but things, things improved generally, there was some curbing and guffering, the council was, was dirt poor. It was a very small <coughs> area, so they didn't have much of a, a funding pool to to progress works. Um, there were very few, the, the area was poorly lit. Um, there was a, a problem with larrikinism in the late 1890s, um, especially that area around uh, the uh, McDonald Street overpass. That was the, the haunt of the McDonald Town push. Uh, and uh, there was a uh, shots fired and, uh, and people hauled in over. Um, and now there weren't larrikins in the the present sense that we refer to larrikins, these were these were thugs. These were people who who marauded around the streets and um, caused havoc in, in in other ways. So from that point, it, in time, um, the centre of the area became increasingly uh, Erskineville. Erskineville Road, and so there was a push to rename the suburb, which came into being in uh, 1893, but the, the push for it came um, almost 18 months prior in April 1892, uh, when it was thought that if they changed the name of McDonald Town to Erskineville, that the value of uh, residents in the area would improve by 5% which prompted a wag in the Riverina in, in a Wagga Wagga newspaper of all things to, uh, to state that perhaps that they, the residents who didn't own, they are all largely renters and they'd be subjected to rent increases if the value of homes went up by 5%. The suggestion was made that maybe the residents should petition to uh, change the name to Deadman's Gully, or Murderer's Flat, or Jackass Point. And to get 5% knocked off. <laughs> it, it, it may not have knocked off 5% given 
a large area of it was uh, known as Typhoid Valley and the Valley of Disappointment. <laughs> and so following this name change, the council set about changing the names of the post office, the school, McDonald Town Park, to Erskineville. So now we have Erskineville Superior School, um, Erskineville Park, Erskineville Post Office. But one thing to this day remains unchanged. <laughs> um, it, it wasn't without it wasn't without trying. Um, during this changeover of the naming to, to Erskineville, the, the Erskineville Council um, submitted that the name of McDonald Town train station be changed to Pineville. It didn't fly, and the council um, supported the motion that the, ch the name of McDonald Town station be changed to Erskineville North, and that in doing so we should let the, the new town council know and get them on board about this as well. The Newtown Council were not on board. The, uh, the Newtown Council said that, yeah, we, we would love to participate in the change of this name, however, we believe that the, the, count, the train station being in uh, Newtown, uh, we, should, we should have to say that it be changed to, uh, to Burren Street instead of um, North Erskineville. Uh, but someone at the council did like the sound of Pineville and, and uh, gave that a go. But, they got back to Erskineville Council and said, thanks for coming, uh, it'll be, it'll be Burren Street. And so Erskineville Council were outraged. They, they declared in the minutes that it was a mistake to ever um, deal with the new, towns, the new town council. And so they said that they would go it alone. And so new town council, hearing about this, said, we're going to go it alone as well. And so both of them petitioned the Commissioner of Railways to change the name of their preferred, uh, their preferred naming. And I think the Commissioner, and it took them six to nine months, simply decided to not change the name. <laughs> now, I, I think generally the boundaries of McDonald Town or Erskineville and Newtown are to the railway. So I, I think. <coughs> I think mainly the, uh, the Newtown Council probably had the upper hand in saying that the, the station was in, was in Newtown. Because you, they've, they've since built over the, the ticket office there, but you can see that the ticket office was in, was in Newtown and perhaps only one platform could qualify as being in Erskineville. <laughs> so moving along. I think I'd like to, to, to cover, and first I'll cover it in, in brief. What has really surprised me in my learning about the area is the amount of pills and potions and cures from the 1890s until about a change of legislation in the 1930s knocked a lot of this on the head. Um, and, and that is the, the pills, potions and cures. And they're almost like celebrity endorsements of their era. Uh, you could there are a few over there but you can see that people will put their names to these cures and this one's from Bray Street um, this is a bile beans for biliousness <laughs> and these were good for biliousness, indigestion, constipation piles, bad blood pimples and all skin eruptions, bad breath debility, fullness after eating Nervousness, dyspepsia, sick and nervous headaches, dizziness, loss of appetite, insomnia, summer fag, and a host of other elements that owe their origin to defective bile flow, assimilation, and digestion. So basically, if you suffered from anything, these would address it. Um, this is a good one. This is a, a bit of an Australian invention, um, supposedly uh, informed by uh, Aboriginal herbs and, uh, and cures. Uh, but it was essentially a marketing ploy from an American cure, um, Dr. Morse's Indian Root Pills, that had the similar origin story. And an origin story for a, a cure is, is pretty common as well. So, 
Moving on to Dr. Moss and Henry Pills, this is one from Burham Street. <laughs> and and they, they treat similar things. Uh, this one also does liver diseases, complexion, gravel, gallstones, jaundice, flatulency, um, female ailments, uh, eczema, rheumatism, and impure blood. So, yeah, this, this gentleman um, spent years travelling the world, the, the inventor, uh, all throughout Asia. Uh, and Africa, uh, but ultimately decided on, on herbs uh, that he found after living several years with Indian tribe, North American um, tribes. However, it, the ingredients were, um, were had nothing to do with uh, anything you could find in, in North America. Uh, likewise, this one's from Ashmore Street. This is a, a paste uh, that's basically um, Vaseline and eucalyptus oil at the end of the day. Mm -hmm. uh, and the medi medical profession um, basically question why you'd want to put eucalyptus oil into open wounds. Um, <laughs> and it's wonderful that at the time the British Medical Association looked at these cures and, and broke them down and then tried to find out what was in them. This is probably one of the few I've found that the British Medical Association thought, this one's okay. Uh, this is um, George Fuley. He lived in Pleasant Avenue. And uh, you can still get fish with phosphorine from using pharmacy in the city. And it's, uh, it's just a digestive. Um, and uh, and he, he went on to live uh, a pretty good long life by the, by the sound of it. So they're, they're quite formulaic. Generally, you've got a poor resident of a poor suffering resident of Erskineville, who's got severe symptoms of anything going, um, and essentially the doctors can't cure them. They've tried everything, uh, and someone recommends that they try a pill. It's usually a friend because it's worked for them, and so. While the, the person for whom it first cures usually takes a few pills or a bottle, it tends to take a dozen bottles to cure anyone um, when it comes to um, a, a lasting result. And, and sometimes you'll find that people will um, invite you to come over to see them as living proof that they are cured. And, uh, and just this one's about um, May Allport, and, and May, May has a long association, or rather her family does, with these pills, potions and cures, because we first find her as a, as a baby being um, referred to in an Arnott's advertisement, uh, being a full, plump and healthy child uh, of, say, six months. And then we see that she's suffering from um, rickets and general wasting while living in uh, Baldwin Street. And then in Charles Street, we see that she's uh, she's not struck down by rheumatism. So she's had a. <laughs> but they must be true. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so this is one of my favourites. I haven't written this one up yet, but uh, this will be a subject of, of future research. Mr. Francis of Union Street had a 20-year association with Dome's products, and, and I love that. You know, this one on the right here, backache. And kidney pills. It refers to a family member um, being struck and, and ultimately cured by a known pill. But, but this one on the left, itching and protruding piles, he was happy to claim that one. <laughs> <laughs> and so Erskineville had its own cure, its own homegrown cure, and it was, it was Garrett's extract. It was manufactured in Victoria Street. There was a manufacturing chemist there. Um, and it was a, a remedy you, you bought and you diluted at home with copious quantities of, of sugar and, and a dash of water. Um, I haven't worked out the, the chemical makeup of that at the moment, but a Canadian equivalent contained chloroform. <laughs> but generally, all of these cures, um, their main operation was to make you poop. <laughs> Uh, so that's, that was clearing up the kidney and uh, all the rest, so it was the expulsion. Uh, 
Another one that was manufactured locally was uh, Garrett's emulsion, which was essentially a, a cod liver oil, but it was ice cream flavoured. So it, it was uh, good for the kids. And they actually had a radio show. And it, it wasn't the only one. A couple of cures at the time sponsored radio uh, spots, and so they could, uh, they could get some promotion. And I think this one was promoting uh, an exercise chart. And another one manufactured locally is um, Lubrilax. And this also had a, um, a radio show associated with it. it it's, um, and there's, there's a lot to, to learn there that I am um, yet to work in progress, this one. This guy had a very long association with uh, developing cures and the like. Um, so there's, there's a good story there once I, once I get through it. And just one example of a bananas person, uh, and we have a couple of people here that have since moved into this location. Mm -hmm. that. This was um, typical of the, the Arnott's advertising at the time. People would send in a photograph or a drawing and they'd be um, represented in the newspapers here. And, and these are all throughout the streets of the poorer areas of Sydney. And people are encouraged to feed their children um, Arnott's milk arrowroot biscuits soaked in milk, uh, also the infirm, uh, and you get the impression that children were fed exclusively on uh, Arnott's milk arrowroot biscuits. <laughs> so I'm going to take a bit of time to go through the story of an Erskineville man cured to stay cured. Um, this is the story of John Loney, who had a 15 or 18 year association. And I love that they really do try to cover off on everything that you might need these for. And I love that it's, these pills will counteract the harmful effects of beer, spirits, and tea. There was a bit of a, a, bit of a um, temperance movement in Sydney at the time, the late uh, 1890s or so. So they're, they're really trying to cover off on everything uh, on that one, I think. So John Loney, he's, uh, this gentleman up here in the top top corner, and he lived on Swanson Street, directly across from the school. Um, he's, he was a builder, he built mainly homes, and I found a church that he built in Surrey Hills. And he moved to the area in 1889, and he's about 74 years old in that photo, which makes him a pretty good candidate for a, for a cure. And he, he built 26 Swanson Street as his house. And there are a couple of workers' cottages you'll see attached to that that were also constructed by him that were probably generating rent for him. So the thing I love about these and John Loney's story is that he has a really long association with it and a lot of them are illustrated. And the language is wonderful and, and it follows the formula very nicely and, and he is quoted, his story is quoted in this story in, in these advertisements over years and he says, I wish to give you particulars of my experience with Doan's backache and kidney pills. I owe these pills a debt of gratitude for they have cured me of a very serious kidney disease. My trouble started three years ago when I first had to lay up. I had terrible pain in the back and right side and my secretions scalded were thick and contained sedimentary matter. <laughs> I also had fits of giddiness and every day would have violent headache. For three years I spent an average of two weeks out of every three in bed. I had medical advice and treatment. Ten leading Sydney physicians treated me in the three years of my illness. Their bills totaled, totaled 180 pounds. The general idea was that I suffered with stone in the kidneys. I was constantly advised to undergo an operation. At last, a specialist put me under the x-rays. He found no foreign substance in the kidneys, but a dark veil enveloped the right kidney, showing pronounced disease. He told me an operation would not benefit me. I then gave up all hope of recovery. He told me he had been unable to get it out at all, and one box cured him for good. One could not but be convinced that he was in thorough earnest, so I sent for a supplier. I used nine boxes and was cured. This was seven months ago. I felt no good effects till I was using the third box, and after that my recovery was gradual. I have not needed to take the pill since, and I am still in the best of health. 
My case is the most marvellous in that I am an aged man. I am 74. The medicine I took before I used Dome's pills would stock a chemist's shop. I might mention that the operation which had been suggested was to cost 60 pounds. My cure by Dome's pills cost me less than 30 shillings. If I had used these pills when I first got ill, I would be considerably over 200 pounds richer today. <laughs> My recovery is well known and may be authenticated by many, but if anybody would like to see me personally, I would be pleased to see them. <laughs> now, while he claims that he no longer has to take the pills, the pills contain a little pamphlet that would say, in kidney disease, patients are so easily discouraged to continue taking the pills. <laughs> This is one of the symptoms of the disease. <laughs> <laughs> so these, these started in 1905 and they ran to about 1918. And some, sometimes there are long associations and sometimes it's a, a promotion may just appear once and then you'll never see it again. But this must have been compelling for it to have lasted so long. Um, and in time, they, these get updated, and some years later, four or five years later, um, they revisit Mr. Loney, who remains proof. And uh, he says, he reiterates, the above is true, and I am pleased to say that I am still free of kidney trouble. Um, the cure is marvellous for I am now 76. And it just follows him, they check back and he, the reports are updated that he is now 77. Mm -hmm. um, they even get his wife Mary involved to say that he is still in excellent health. Um, and it's also updated some years down the track with a reference to that he sent for a supply to the Ellis Pharmacy, which is this is a picture of the Imperial uh, Hotel, and you'll see here, this is the, the Alice uh, chemist and dentist, <coughs> together at last, um, from which he sent his supply. And so these, these continued, and he, he continued to reinforce that he remained living proof uh, that these domes, backache and kidney pills um, were, were a, a lasting cure. Uh, the language is, is wonderful. And uh, variations appear all around Australia. Some of these residents of Erskineville even appear in newspapers in, in New Zealand. Uh, but if, you, if you're in Erskineville or, or any, any area of Sydney, you may find that some your, your house uh, was, a, was a place from which these were promoted. And so, of course, it, it too had an origin story, uh, a Canadian origin story. Um, it's uh, a product of, uh, I think, the, the Shakers. Uh, and this is um, Auntie Rogers. Uh, she was known for her great skill in compounding medicines uh, from certain roots and herbs. And the funny thing is, most of these cures claim to be um, purely herbal, but very often they are not. Um, this one contained uh, potassium nitrate. Uh, so some things were, were there to, uh, I think the, the best thing you might have found in a, a pill was, was rust. Uh, but generally it was, was a bit of pine gum uh, and, and mint, uh, a bit of licorice. So that's, that's me largely gone, um, and the thing, these are the things really that got me hooked um, as an armchair historian, and I'm, I'm very thankful to, to Craig and to Sean who are coming up too, because it was really, and Matt, for his book, thank you, um, who, who really got me engaged with the history of the area. And so, if you're looking at the, the history of, of your own house, a really good location is the National Library of Australia, who have scanned the newspapers uh, online. They're yet to scan in the local Newtown newspaper, which I'm uh, very keen to, to get a hand on. Uh, it's un still only available in, in microfiche. But you'll find uh, in the National Library archives 
Uh, a lot of the newspapers from throughout uh, Australia that will often make reference perhaps to your own home that can help you. Um, a, lot, a lot of the homes in Erskineville predate street numbering. So you may find that, especially if you live in a, a row of several houses, you will find that, uh, or you may find that your house uh, had a name. The State Library is also very good for photographs. And a lot of the photographs I'll put up during the break, just cycling through some of you may have seen at the beginning, come from the City of Sydney Archives. And uh, the City of Sydney Archives also contain a collection of the Sydney SAMS directories. And that's, they're essentially the, the white pages of the, uh, from the 1880s to the 1930s. And they, if you work backwards from the 1930s, you can, using street numbers, you can work your way back and get a, build a history of the, the people who lived in your house over the years. Uh, and, and then you'll see the houses <coughs> and residents disappear as, as you move back in time and the, 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 the streets were more sparsely populated. So thank you all for listening. Um, I understand we're going to have a break. I might go to you, Sean, and, and um, let us know what's going on.